Hello there, I'm Bridget Surratt with Canna Patient Resource Connection. Welcome to our first course for our volunteers in our leadership conference. This is called Choosing Leadership, and I can assure you whether you're a cannabis patient or not, uh, whatever issue you are advocating for, uh, these courses do apply. All right. Uh, in our membership, we did a survey to find out really what people thought was a good leader. Who was a good leader and why? Uh, we got a couple of, of different uh, responses. Uh, however, these three were mentioned multiple times. The first one is the Dalai Lama. The second is Nick Saban, so we clearly had some Alabama fans in there. And uh, Sir Richard Branson who's known for being a philanthropist, was also named as a good leader. Just to show you how many different ways you can define a leader, what is a leader? Well, according to Simon Sinek, uh, a leader is just somebody who places themselves in a protective role over others. John Maxwell, another fam famous leadership expert, also states that it's somebody who has a servant's heart. Elementary school kids will just tell you it is the kid at the front of the line, the line leader. More often than not, though, the majority just see a leader as simply the person who's in charge at the time. However, leaders are trained. Being a leader is a choice, and every single person has the potential to be one. Leaders work on developing relationships and their goal is not to accumulate the accolades and things. Yes, it's okay to get them. It's okay to be recognized for your work. Uh, and those accolades come often as a result of good, genuine, heartfelt work. Uh, however, if those are your goals, you're doing it wrong. Leaders also tend to have stories with very action-inspiring whys. They have stories that resonate with other people. And realistically speaking, we all have those. We have to learn how to effectively tell them. And uh, to speak to that, the third course in this is called Effective Storytelling. A good leader also grows their business by investing with people. It all goes back to building relationships and building people up rather than doing things for self-sacrifice. So what's the difference between a manager and a leader? And let's critically analyze ourselves here. Are we managers or are we leaders? And what can we work on to move from the manager category into the leader category? If you only manage things and you're not a leader, you are ordering others around. You're investing in yourself. You're using emotions like fear to manipulate. You're using the fear, micromanagement, and judgment as tactics rather than uplifting things. You're sacrificing others for your ambition. You're working to only build personal credit and you're not seeking outside knowledge. We all have bad managers who seem to know everything, who threaten us passive aggressively, uh, who use fear, who micromanage. Uh, nothing we do is good enough. They have unrealistic expectations. And they will immediately, and without a doubt or a hesitation, throw you under the bus. However, a leader does things very differently. A leader is going to be in the trenches with the people who need the help the most. They're going to show others how to be leaders themselves, and they're going to show others how to improve their situations. They're going to invest in the relationships between the people. They're not going to be investing in that self-promotion. <clears throat> leaders, true leaders, are aware of how to use emotions and how powerful they are, and how they impact others, and they use them ethically. Real leaders make people feel safe. They don't passive-aggressively threaten them. Real leaders are self-sacrificing. They will give you the shirt off their back 
and they will lift you up and they would rather see you successful than get the recognition for themselves. Real leaders work to build momentum in their causes and momentum in lifting other, people's up, other people up and real leaders are lifelong learners. So what are some habits of a great leader? Leaders, real leaders do not use social media for personal drama. Again, a real leader does not use social media for personal drama. All of that is handled privately behind the scenes. Real leaders don't engage in petty personal attacks, and they focus on issues rather than people. Leaders use their power as ethically as they possibly can, and they see themselves as a protector. Real leaders are lifelong learners because they always question their accuracy. They're always wondering, do I have the latest information? Am I correct about that? Is the other person's perspective something I really need to take into consideration? And that's what a true leader does. They listen to all sides of the situation and then they make their judgments. Stephen Covey wrote an entire book on the eighth habit of a successful person. He has the seven habits of highly successful people all crammed into one book and then wrote a single book based on the eighth habit. The eighth habit is to replicate the leadership. A real leader replicates their leadership. They understand that a cause can live and die with one person. And so they replicate it so that their work lives on regardless of who is doing it or getting the credit. Rosabeth Moss Cantor. She has a TEDx talk that you can Google. It is on YouTube, should you choose to look it up. But she offers six steps to success. Show up. You can't grab an opportunity that you're not there to get. And I understand that not everybody can show up to everything. That's totally fine. But every person has a niche, and unless you are in your niche doing what you need to do, you cannot grab those opportunities because you're not there working your issue to grab them. Speak up, but when you do, be sure to name the problem. And don't just complain about it. Offer a solution. Often, we hear people tell us how we should be doing things and how we're doing them wrong because we're not doing them their way but they don't offer help, they don't offer solutions, and they don't offer anything real other than just using us as a venting platform. Don't do that to other people. <coughs> I apologize, I'm coming down with something. So be sure you speak up, but be sure you do so productively. Look up. If you are so narrow-minded that you are only focused on the exact issue at hand and you're not taking all of the pieces of the puzzle into consideration, you might be missing a whole bunch, uh, and that may actually end up compromising your integrity. So keep your vision and keep your values, and be sure to look up and make sure that you have a bird's eye view of what's going on. That includes more perspectives than just your own. Team up. I can't stress that enough. There is no humanly way possible for any one person to affect an issue successfully without teaming up and getting help from others. Generally speaking, most issues require more than one strategy in order to effectively uh, make change. And that requires more than one person. So team up. Never give up. Giving up is the only way you sure fire will fail. Everything you do is going to look like a failure in progress. And people are going to tell you how horrible you're doing, how you're doing it all wrong. You're going to get bullied. You're going to get yelled at. Uh, people are going to be ugly. But don't give up. Every single thing that you do will look like a failure. You know, if you're baking a cake, the cake looks like crap until it's done and it's decorated. It looks like a failure until it's finished. Keep that in mind. 
Stick to your cause. Keep your integrity. Just don't give up. Also remember to lift others up. Again, going back to that eighth habit from Stephen Covey, uh, uh, Roosevelt Moss Cantor does echo that. Share your success. Replicate your leadership so that others may share in that success as well. The more you lift up, the more community you build, the more what happens at government level doesn't matter because your community is strong enough to hold on. Heather Stagels, unhealthy responses to resistance. There are a couple things that we do that are uh, unhealthy responses, and every single person does them. These aren't relegated to any particular class, any particular race, anyone. Uh, we all do these things. We all tend to take resistance to change very personally. We'll go up to our friends and say, hey, we've got this awesome idea, and they're like, I don't know about that. Um, most resistance to change is never, ever personal. It's based on a system of beliefs, um, culture, or experiences that person has, and those are just as valid as any of those things that we've experienced. Um, so don't have hurt feelings when people resist change. It's totally normal, and it's part of the process. One of the other unhealthy things that we do uh, when, with regards to resisting change is we try to blame others for not changing. And this, in psychology, is called fundamental attribution error. Uh, and basically, it, <clears throat> it's the principle of if I do it, I have a justified reason for doing it, but if you do it, you're wrong. Um, or as we like to say in psychology, uh, my issue is perfectly fine, but yours needs therapy. Uh, that's not okay. And we have to understand that every single one of us does this in some manner, and we've got to, we've got to stop. Um, we tend to blame others for not changing rather than getting to the crux of really why that person is resisting change. Uh, so don't forget we do this ourselves, and we are just as flawed as those that we tend to blame and get upset with. The other really unhealthy thing we do uh, in response to the resistance to change is we try to focus on just blanketly eliminating behaviors rather than really uncovering the source of the resistance. That's treating symptoms rather than treating the disease. And realistically speaking, we have to treat the disease. So ask the why. This is where the why becomes incredibly important, and we have to put those assumptions aside. We cannot just try to eliminate behaviors or blame others for their behaviors or assume why they're making those decisions. Ask. You might be surprised. And once you understand their why, you may find there are some legitimate issues that they need some compassion in dealing with, that they have found uh, fall on deaf ears. And once we open up those lines of compassion the other way, we generally tend to get them back our way. So influencing positive change. Don't assume your opposition's why. Ask. Always be willing to ask for help. You're not going to be able to do everything yourself. Unless you never sleep, you do nothing but drink energy drinks all day. Um, and you're literally the energizer bunny, um, which in, in that case, you're just going to work yourself into a heart attack anyway. Be willing to ask for help. Listen, and listen not to respond and not to engage in debate, but listen to understand and, and engage in real, meaningful conversations. It does make a difference, and it is not the same as you listening to respond. If you're listening to respond to somebody and you're not ever digging deeper, again, you're doing it wrong. Help with no expectations. A lot of times we do things, but we expect stuff in return. I find that if you just reach out and you see somebody who needs help and you offer that help, nine times out of ten, it may take a while, but you're going to build up relationships and those people will be willing to help you in return when you need it. Be willing to fail. This is a big one. It's huge because you're going to fail. You're going to flub up. You're going to make mistakes. 
You're going to do idiotic things. We're human. It happens. It's, it's totally fine. But be willing to fail and be willing to take those hits because they're going to happen. And that's okay. The only way to truly, truly fail is to give up. Just learn from your mistakes. That's all it is. It's a learning experience. Teaching moments, as we like to say. So, and expect change to be bumpy and expect it to take a long time and understand you will not be pleasing everyone. So, what I'm going to do, I have a video here for you. It is a TEDx talk and it is Jason Clark. And this talk specifically goes into discussing resistance to change. Someone gets up in the dead talk and says, Behold, we don't have to do it like this. I've got a better idea. There's another way. There's another technology. There's a new way of seeing the world. And then you guys go, wow, that's fantastic. We'll, we'll go out and create change. And you can't wait to go to your workplace or go back to the people you live with and say, Rejoice, my people. There is a better way. It doesn't have to be this way. And you're expecting the whole world to go, Fantastic, it's going to change. And this is what you hit. You go, come on, we could do this, we could totally do this. And they go, no. You know what? Because we've done it before, or now's not a good time, or we haven't got the money, or it's been done, it's never been done, that's not the way we do things around here, it's not part of the charter, it's traditional, it's complicated, it's political. Do you recognize any of these? And of course, they're all different ways of saying this. They're all just different ways of saying it's not going to happen. So what I've been doing, I work in the innovation space. I'm interested in this wall. How do we get past this wall? How do we take our passion and our ideas and actually make them happen? So I've been trying to figure out what this wall is made of and how do we get past it. If we can't get past it, go under it, go around it, or just smash through it. The first thing you need to know, these aren't real reasons. These aren't real reasons. And the reason that becomes pretty clear because they're so easy to refute. If they say, for example, it's always been like this, what does that mean? It means the problem is older than you think it is. It's not an argument for not changing it now. It's a reason why we should have changed it 20 years ago. And when they say it's the same everywhere, what they're really saying is the problem is broader and wider than you think. That's not an argument for not fixing it here. It's an argument for fixing it everywhere. When they say, for example, it's not in the budget, it means we've spent the money in the wrong places. Right? And when they say it's not in the charter, what they're saying is the people who are supposed to provide the vision weren't thinking as big as you. And when they say uh, it's political, what they're saying is I've learned to keep my ideas to myself. And when they say it's just traditional, what they're saying is, actually, I don't know why we do this, but it's always been that way. <coughs> okay. And the thing is, they are so easy to refute. Yeah. So when they say things, for example, like, it's too complicated, you say, I can make it simpler for you. And when they say, do you know what, it just sounds like it's too simple, you say, that's okay, I'll make it more complicated. And my favorite one, a friend of mine got this one the other day. This isn't what we pay you to do. And his answer was, that's okay, this one's a freebie. So, if these aren't the real reasons, then what are? What are the real reasons? No. Now, no one will tell you what the real reasons are, but I've been collecting them. I'm going to show you the seven most the classic reasons why people resist change and what to do about them. I'm too full of emotion and fear to think about what you're talking about. This is a big one, yeah? This has all come as a huge shock. That just means, thanks for the heads up. No one told me about it, and now I'm just dealing with, you know, horror. I'm scared of the transition, not the idea. Very often we think they don't like the idea. What they're really worried about is the journey to the idea. I don't know how big a deal this change really is. Um, I don't see how I fit into any of this. I feel like I have no say in what happens. This is really what people are saying. And the one that cracks me up, the big one, is this one. I'm fed up with phony change. I want the real thing. Very often when people are saying, no, it won't work, they're not saying they don't want change. They're saying, I want change that's real. I want something I can believe. So let me take you through these one at a time. Uh, I was going to do work, I was doing with a group of people who were supposed to be planning the future of their organization. And 20 minutes before I turned up, they all got fired. Right? And the organizer said, maybe we don't want to do the workshop now. Because it was going to be about the future. I said, no, actually, this is more the reason why we have the workshop now, because we just have a different context. What will the future be for these people? And every time that something happens, every time there's a change, there's three basic ways you can go about it. 
you can say, I want to see the positives, I want to see what's interesting about it, or I just want to focus on the negatives. Now, these people have just been fired. What do you think? The negatives. So instead of trying to change their minds to help them embrace the change, I just said, how do you feel about it? And these were the four things. I feel I'm scared, I'm angry, I feel betrayed, I feel stupid. I let them talk for about 15 minutes, and everything that came out of them was a variation on those same four. And I wrote them down and said, have you got anything new? So after 15 minutes, they were exhausted. There was nothing else to say about the negativity. And then they started saying things like this. You know, I kind of knew this was happening. I've never liked it here. I've only been putting up with this job out of sufferance. In fact, I need a good push. This is the best thing that happened. They got there by themselves. And all I was doing was ratifying their feelings. I was just listening to how they felt. And then, before I knew it, they were here. They were saying, this is great. I'm going to go back to study. I'm going to travel. Why don't we build our own little support group and keep in touch with each other? Now, all of them have got better jobs, and they all keep in touch. Because they went through this whole thing of what's the negatives, the interestings, and the positives. If you've ever seen a small child running and they fall over, for a couple of seconds, they don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. They're not sure. Have you noticed? They just sit there in this kind of neutral space like, okay, this is different. And what will happen is if dad says, that was funny, then the kid gets up and does it again. But if mum runs up and she goes, oh, my darling, are you okay? The kid goes, I don't think so. So as children, we have this positive, interesting, negative space. And this interesting space is where the artist is, it's where the innovator is, it's where the inventor is. I'll say, gee, this is unusual, what can we do with this? But as we get older, we compress that space and we see everything in terms of this, this dichotomy between good and bad. This is, this is good, this is bad. And our default is to react to every change as being bad. So this is a way of people to understand, to audit their emotions about the state. What about this? I'm scared of the transition, I'm not scared of the idea. See. I used to think it was about saying, this is what we're doing at the moment, it's no good. This is where we should be going, it's way better. And what I've realized is the way we do things now, we've got a couple of good things going for it. The status quo is all of these things. It is known, it's proven, it's familiar. Sure, it's insane, but we know how to do it. But we don't have to adjust anything. It's crazy, but it's what we do. You've heard that argument? Whereas, what's the problem with B? Well, it's all of this stuff. It's unproven, it's, it's uncertain, it's freaky. Someone told me once, everyone's afraid of something. Very true. We've all got something we're afraid of. And it could be failure or ridicule or clowns. I mean, I don't care what it is. In the unknown, the thing you're scared of could be there. I'm scared of maths. I'm enumerate. So any change where I have to do some numbers, I get very you know, concerned about. So if the unknown contains maths, I'm nervous. So how do we solve that problem? Well, it's pretty easy. Between where we are and where we're going to get to is all of this stuff. And this is foreseeable, predictable stuff. We know about this. Yeah? I'm someone who, I, I, like fly, I don't like flying very much. I like coming to Perth, but I don't like getting to Perth. Yeah? So what happens if I have a really turbulent flight? If the captain says it's going to be bumpy, get over it, I'm fine. If he says nothing, I'm imagining at the front of the plane, you know, the cockpit's on fire and he's madly trying to control us from going at because I'm not being told. Okay. So this is the trick. It's giving people the heads up. It'll be bumpy, it'll be weird. Just fasten your seatbelts, this will be the ride. I don't know how big a deal this change really is. I love this one. You think about this idea of four doors. The first door are the things that we used to be able to do and can still do. I get people to write a list. What are things that we could do before the change that we could still do? So I know one organization that said to its staff, you're going to be working from home in whatever hours you like. Everybody freaked out. And we said, okay, what are the things that won't change? Will we still have email? Will we still make phone calls? Will we still be in the same business? Yes. A long list of things that weren't going to change. Oh, everyone calms down. Door number two are the things that we couldn't do before and we still can't do. Make a list. Well, we can't put poison in our product and I suppose we can't cheat or lie or steal or you know, that kind of thing. That's also a long list. Door number three are the things that we could do before and we can't do now. In this case, it was get stuck in peak hour traffic and have long meetings that go nowhere. Gosh, could you sacrifice those? Can put door number four. It's a door that's only recently opened. And these are the things we couldn't do before, but we can do now. It means I can make my job suit my lifestyle. I can get away from this work life balance thing and start thinking work life harmony. See some sense in this? So what we're really asking you to do is to say, guess what? This is what we currently do. This is all the stuff that won't change. This is the stuff we're asking to let go of. This is the stuff to get to do with exchange.
suddenly everybody calms down. They can see the change has got edges to it. Okay. I don't see how I fit in any of this. People feel like they're not being consulted. Key to this is the difference between authorship and ownership. What we do is we say to people, here is the change. Own the change. Gosh, why aren't people having ownership of the change? We've seen this happen. I'm going to say, here's why we're going to change, here's what has to change, here's how it's got to change, and you report to me, and by the way, I want you to own it. It doesn't work. What works is authorship. If you say, here's why we have to change, here are some things that have to change, but you tell me how. You tell me how you're going to make it work. You give them authorship. You empower them to design the change themselves. And suddenly it's not, they're not responding to change, they're taking control of change. Here's one of my favourite techniques for this, what we call the renovator's delight. You think about it, have you ever renovated a house? What did you keep? What did you chuck? What did you change? What do you add? They're the only four questions. And we talk to organisations and say, take this tool, what would you do? What would you keep? They say, we would keep our values, we'd keep our passion, we'd keep our enthusiasm, we'd keep our best people. What would you chuck? We'd chuck our negativity, right? we'd chuck our systems, we'd get rid of the bureaucracy and the red tape. What would you change? We'd change our culture, we'd change our attitude, we'd change our thinking. What do you want to add? We want to add empowerment, and innovation and creativity and fun. Guess what? They've just designed all the things that we thought we'd have to convince them to do. Now it's their idea. You see the power in this? They've been given authorship. They're given the power around to make the change. Okay. Yeah, but people hate change. Don't they? Well, if this is true, we've got to tell the fashion industry right away. Because they are based entirely on the idea that people want to change their look. We better talk to the tourism industry as well, because apparently people don't want to go to other places. Yeah, I mean, and all those people in gyms and those people are trying to lose weight, and people having cosmetic surgery or getting their hair done. We've got to tell them how much they hate change. And people who have elections and people who have affairs, we've got to tell them too. No, apparently you hate change. It's not true. Guess what? Bored people want change. Frustrated people want change. Passionate people want change. Irritable people, cynical people. Actually, the number of people who want change is much greater than we imagine. It's not true that we hate it. In fact, this is closer to the truth. When I take a brief on working with a group, I'll be told that people don't want change. And I listen very carefully to what people say. And what's interesting is as the conversation evolves, it's not that they don't want change. The truth is down in here somewhere. The truth is they want real change. They're sick of believing something that isn't real. They want something genuine. So let's look at that. The thing is, we've all, we've all dealt with this before. We know what it is. We know how the lack of change can get packaged up to something new, and we're savvy to it. Someone comes in and says, behold my people, we're going to do it differently, we're going to change everything else. You go, yeah, 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 this is just new look, bam. You know, it's just a repackaging. So how do we know the difference? And is it likely that we now suspect all change has been fake? You think, you know what, <laughs> you, know, you, you tricked me once in 1972. I'm not believing you again. I've heard all this before, because that's the problem. See, real change sounds very much like fake change. It's hard to pick the difference. So here's the thing. I do work in, well, probably, probably every sector, uh, commercial, non-commercial, government, I mean, any group you can think of, not for profit. I ask people how do they spend their time? Where does their career go? How do they estimate their use of time? This is the first uh, map that I get, which is, there's a very large amount of our time is spent just staying out of trouble. Yeah? The three rules in any organization is attract praise, avoid blame, don't stand near the fan. And we learn this. Yeah? And when you think about how is the rest of the time broken up, well, there's an awful lot of turf squabbling going on. Who's in charge? Who's the boss? Who's got the biggest desk? And then let's allow some time for you know, just office intrigues. So what ends up happening is this tiny little sliver for actual achievement. And you know what? I've been running this as an unofficial straw poll now for 15 years, and everyone says it's basically what it looks like. So when I say, here is a change, you can go, yeah, you know what? This is more of the same. Guess what? I think people are hungry for that little green wedge there. I think people are hungry for actual achievement. I don't believe we want to dedicate our lives to nothing. I don't believe that we're here so that we can achieve zero. I think we're here so it amounts to something somehow. So let's look at that. Your clock's gone crazy, but that's okay. Is the change real or fake? That's an important question. Is this a genuine opportunity or is it phony? I think that's an important question. By the way, fake change, no good. Real change, good. Just casually ensure. 
Is the change cultural or structural? This is a huge question, right? Structural changes, we change the reporting, we change the org chart, we change the name of the organisation, and everything keeps going the same way. Until you change the way we think, unless you change the actual culture, you have zero change. Does that make sense? And then finally, <coughs> is the change offered or foisted? Am I invited to the change? <coughs> am I invited to the change or am I forced to make change? And guess what? Real change, which is cultural and offered, works. Fake change, which is structural and foisted, doesn't work and shouldn't. So let me show you how to break that up. If I'm talking to you now, you've got two choices. Really, your minds could be open or closed. That's your choice. I can't, I can't affect that as well. You could say, you know what? I'm not buying a thing this guy says. That's your right. Or you could go, yep, I'm totally into it. That's also your choice. Yeah. This is the choice that any group that you talk to will make. I have choices as well. I could be talking about something genuine or something phony. That's my choice. So what are the outcomes of the choices that you can make and the choices that I can make? Let's look at them. Let's imagine that you've got your mind open and what I have for you is nothing. This is just phony, phony change. You know what that means for you? Big disappointment. You've got your hopes up one more time, you've been let down one more time. That's what that means. So what would happen though, if this was an empty, shallow badging and you went, no, nah, I'm not buying it, then you win. You reserve the right to say, I told you so, I didn't buy that for a second, it didn't fool me. But what about this? What if your mind is shut and we have a real opportunity here? We're talking about something genuine. Guess what? You lose the opportunity, you lose the possibility. But if your mind is open, what I'm telling you is real, then here's where we are. We have an opportunity to make a real difference. So when I work with very cynical closed groups, I present them with this choice. I'll say, here's your choice. You have the choice to close your mind, to lose a rare opportunity to make change for the right to say, I told you so. Or you could give this a fair chance and open your mind and risk disappointment for the chance of making a difference. When you lay it out like that, the choice is practically pretty straightforward. This is my belief about people. What are we here for? What do we want? If you're a young person, the conversation is about destiny. If you're an old person, the conversation is about legacy. It's still the same. What was I here for? What did I do? What did it amount to? I ask people, how do they want to be remembered? What is it for them? Here's, here lies me. I protected the status quo. Do you think that that turns anybody on? Do you think anybody wants that to be their life's achievement? What about this one? I met all my KPIs. I satisfied all departmental and oh standards. Do you think that this excites anyone? Do you think anyone will give their life to this? Or this one? Is this a life? Is this a death? I don't think anybody wants this. I don't think anybody wants this. My belief that a fundamental human need is to contribute, is to make a difference. Because you're here for a certain time and you made something of it. Tolkien said all we have to decide is what to do with the time we have. I put it in a much simpler terms. For me, you can keep things the same or you can make a difference. But you cannot do both. That is the choice you've got to make. I've made mine, you choose yours. And with that, I would like to thank you for choosing our leadership course, um, Choosing Leadership, and uh, check out the other ones, Advocacy Strategies, uh, Navigating Public Meetings is the next one I'm going to convert and post, and already up on YouTube is the effect of storytelling, which goes into how you can share your story, what to include in it. Uh, and how to stay true to yourself, uh, but still get your point across. And I would like to encourage you to uh, go and check those out. Thank you very much, and you guys enjoy.